Welcome to the Go Procast, where we invite business doers who are changing lives by sharing their stories, their strategies and tactics, and who bravely talk about their failures that actually led to their biggest successes. Now it's time to Go Pro with Jeremy Torres. My next guest was homeless as a teenager before he became a beach bum surfer. From there, he found his inner nerd and started in the tech industry. By 25, he was a network engineer working for companies like Microsoft, Compaq, and HP. At 36, he started a web design company. Now, with a doctorate of strategic leadership and a book called Timeless SEO Secrets, Ty Belknap runs Port Bell SEO, an SEO and online marketing company. Please give a warm GoPro welcome to my guest, Ty Belknap. What is going on, Mr. Belknap? Hey, how you doing, Jeremy? Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, pleasure to have you, man. I, I know we've been uh, kind of putting this, uh, we're, we're getting pretty far out, which is exciting that um, people are booking, but you know, I, I read your 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 bio and i get excited because we have so much in common then i have to wait a couple of weeks to meet you which um you know <laughs> is not my forte <laughs> so uh i like to start every every podcast the same it's the only thing i do the same and that, that's by asking uh to tell us something good today something good about today just to, to tell me something good man let's get it started oh. off with some positivity okay well then life is awesome it is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> hey, just like um, I believe I, you know, I, I hate to say this. I don't remember exactly who said it, but someone said every day is a great day. If you don't think so, try missing one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that is a good way to put it. So, um, yeah, so you're into SEO, which for most people, I think, are aware, is aware of what SEO is. But for the most part, um, search engine optimization, it's about it's the organic way to get your business your profile your website on the front page of a google search or any sort of sort of search using keywords is that basically the long and short of it basically yeah okay yeah. i know it goes much deeper and i know there's a lot of math in, in science and 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 there's an art almost to it isn't there it, it actually it really is an art and people don't think of it as an art because it's it has a lot to do with coding yeah. And you don't really think of coding as, as art, but it, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can see it that way. So uh, before we get into where you are, I'd mm -hmm. like to start about where you come from, because I think you and I just, like I said, have a ton in con common there. I was homeless at 17 uh, oh, really? by, by choice. Yep. Yeah. I left. Uh, I always say this, if people who listen, are going to get sick of this joke, but uh, from uh, an arranger scale from full house to shameless, if you ever watch the Showtime show, shameless i'm at about an eight on the showtime shameless scale uh we were pretty pretty ruckus our house you know, a lot of drugs alcohol parties really no um no direction no morals <laughs> a lot of love though my mom loved us she just didn't know how to be responsible you know yeah. so um at 17 i'm like yeah it's, it's easier out on the street I man sleeping on couches than staying here so i yep. took a powder um and i also was near a beach i was i'm in south florida so oh, okay. uh, it's a nice place to uh, hang around all night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, better than Minnesota in the winter, I'm sure. <laughs> so how did, I was how, homeless in Washington. It was a little bit colder here. Wow, Washington. <laughs> I, I pictured you in California being a, a beach bum. But uh, how, how, tell us about your story. Yeah, how, how did that happen? I, I actually became homeless when I was 15. And if, if you don't mind my saying this, no teenager is ever homeless voluntarily. It's always because of something going on at the home, and it's the problem of the parents. The parents yeah. are there really to guide the children to become adults, and if they're not doing that properly, if the kids end up homeless, it's the fault of the parents. It's not the fault of the child ever. And I actually, when, when I became homeless, I thought the same thing. I thought I had run away from home, and I <laughs> thought I had left my parents, where many, many years later, my father actually apologized to me for abandoning me Mm. And it was this was like 30 years later, and it didn't even dawn on me until the day he did that that I realized that it wasn't my choice to yeah. leave home at 15. It was actually because of the way that they were. And my parents weren't terrible parents. Mm -hmm. You know, I I 
I, I wasn't, I, I won't say I wasn't beaten or anything like that. You know, we were punished as kids. And back then in the seventies, you got hit when you were punished. It, they didn't, you know, you know, like take a belt or anything. It was n- never that bad, but, but it was still kind of like with you, the home and, and there wasn't even drugs involved in mine, but mm. the home life just wasn't uh, secure enough for me yeah. to feel safe there really was what yep. it was. Yeah. Yep. So uh, yeah. you leave home. Uh, yep. And that was younger than I was, so I was able to work. And I think you know, in Florida, you could probably work at fifteen, but you're not really doing much. I was, um, yep. you know, doing side, painting apartments, and driving tow trucks, working at gas stations. I worked at a very yep. young age, anyway, cutting grass, washing cars. Uh, I was very, uh, I had, I had my hustle on really young. Um, mm-hmm. But, but uh, what did you do to, uh, you know, get by when you were kind of on your own that young? I dealt drugs. Well, that's hey, listen. That's an option for that's an option. It's not, that, not a good option. It's but the last option, it's, but sometimes it's the only I, option in yeah. your mind when you're in, yeah. a, in that position. I, I tried to get jobs at 15 years old. Of course, most people won't hire you, and and it really isn't. It's not legal without parental permission, or it wasn't back then. Oh, okay. Without parental permission at 15 years old to to work. So, I tried to get a fake driver's license. I got a job for a while until I found out that it was fake. <laughs> and <laughs> and but i was unfortunately i was in the environment of a lot of drugs where yeah. i was in downtown seattle it was a very rough area to be homeless wow, still is then. yeah you know, actually yeah. So, and it still is today it's 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 probably almost as bad today as it was 30 40 years ago um, yeah and they've legalized or at least um normalized drug use there too right like heroin and and well, uh well, and cocaine and things so, so i hear you know through the national media yeah it is it's really weird yeah it's, it's heroin is illegal but they have places where you can safely take it yeah i, I don't get that part i don't either <laughs> <laughs> and of course they say that, that marijuana is not a gateway drug well i'm i'm living proof that it is mm-hmm. and so yeah it's it's did unfortunately you avoid, uh, falling into the drug use itself or did you get caught up in that as well Oh no! I, I became a drug dealer to to pay for my habit. Oh shit! Okay, yeah. that sucks. That's yeah. tougher, man. I don't yeah. know. For some reason, the drugs were all around me. Crack was big. I'm from Miami, you know. So just yeah. South Florida, and crack was huge down here. My sister yeah. always she was 18 months older. She had older boyfriends, you know, 22, 23. So I was, you know, 16, hanging around 23 year olds who were crackheads. Mm. Oh, and yeah. uh, I mean, these guys were hardcore crackheads. But they never, they they always, they always protected me, which is very odd because mm-hmm. normally misery loves company. But yeah. they never, they never <laughs> pushed me. They never offered it. They would do it right in front of me though, mm-hmm. um, and I because I was a protector, so I protected them. They were family, mm-hmm. um, but I was probably lucky in that they never really pushed that stuff on me. You know? Yeah, and I was not really interested or curious even. <laughs> so um, you're you're out on the street. You're slinging yep. drugs to feed your your own drug habit. Um, you're 15 or 16 years old. How long did that last? Almost three years. Three years, a long time to go as a kid. Yeah, I, yeah, I was, I was out on the streets for quite a while. And I finally, I got to the point where, well, I, I hate to say I was almost dead. And I knew that if I was going to keep down the road that I was going, that I would die. And I swallowed my own pride and I contacted my parents who had moved to Hawaii Mm. and they, um, I think they realized what they had done too, because they they got me out there. I, I moved to Hawaii. That's when I became a beach bum surfer. Is when I okay. moved to Hawaii. <laughs> that's a that's a hell and, of a transition then from yeah. the streets of Seattle to Hawaii. Yeah, and I, I do have to say, if you know, living on the streets of Seattle, being a beach bum surfer, pick the surfer one yeah, if you have a the choice. Surfer, no. <laughs> yeah, that would come out on top of my book probably. Yeah. Uh, how did you Much get so sober? Was that a? I mean, when you're young, I think you're more resilient. So was that an easier transition? I. It, it was very difficult getting off of the harder drugs. Now, one thing that that unfortunately, for, well, fortunately or unfortunately, one of the first people I met on the streets, one of the nicest people I ever met, a guy named Jerry, was dying of AIDS, oh, and Christ. was then this is back in the eighties when they knew very little about it, mm-hmm. and he had gotten it from from uh, a hypodermic needle that yeah. he had shared with other people. And so I, I would never, I never once would go anywhere near a needle because oh, of that. Good. Yeah. So that was, that was, t- I think that's one of the things that saved me. So yeah, I never got into those kinds these, of drugs. Yeah. So it's almost like these people were in your lives as an angel, but they were going through oh, yeah. hell, right? Several. Oh, several. Yeah. It's really yeah, good to learn your hardest lessons from people's 
darkest moments instead of having to go through them yourself. Even yeah. though yours are pretty dark, I must say. <laughs> mine, mine was fighting. I was a fighter. I was a brawler. Okay. You yeah. know, streets of Miami. I didn't like, but the drugs again. I could have been, but I was lucky. You know, yeah. I just never got into drugs. But um, I was the protector, so mine was. Uh, I was just a ton of fights. But yeah. um, so you go to Hawaii, you become a beach bum, and yeah. and and that's is that when you start you know, kind of just have time on your hands and the computers that kind of getting you into the later nineties <laughs> when the internet starts breaking and and you get into a tech. Well, I was in. No, I was. I was really got into the whole the whole beach scene. Yeah. And I and it got off the hard drugs. So I, said, I was not the soft drugs still. Mm-hmm. And I did get into computers a little bit, but back then there was only, I mean, the, Microsoft wasn't even around yet. They were, I think they were barely just forming the, the big computers were what was called CPMs. Mm. And so it wasn't even a DOS machine. I mean, Windows was no, no, definitely not heard of. Yeah. But what, what happened was, is I, I, I did a lot of odd jobs. I had the, several businesses that I started and failed while I was in Hawaii. And after being there for five years, I decided to move back to the Pacific Northwest. Okay. And more because Hawaii is, it's it's beautiful and it's fun, but it's 10 to 15 years behind oh, the wow. times. Yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's I mean, it's, it's a great place to escape. It's not a great place to live for most people. So. Yeah. And so I got back to the Pacific Northwest and I, and at that time I had literally, literally about, about three months worth of money to live if I would have stayed in Hawaii. Well, that paid for me to live for about a year mm-hmm. in, in the Seattle area because it's yeah. so expensive in Hawaii. And so I took a year and just rode my bike all around the Pacific Northwest, around the Puget Sound, deciding where I wanted to live. Didn't even know what I wanted to do. When I started running out of money, I started looking for a job. The only job I could find was selling computers. Okay, <laughs> and that's how I how got into computers. Them? What what do you say? Sell them? You, were you uh, were you like Les Smith? Uh, could tear care color TVs door to door, and you're, you're with five boxes going, want to buy a computer? Or were you making phone calls? Or how the heck were you selling computers? I, actually, I was at a Sears store. Sears, wow. Sears, Sears, and Sears had just started. Yeah, Sears and Robux just started offering computers. They were doing computer sales jobs. Nobody would do it. They was that Macintosh? Somebody. Was that was that the Macintosh? Brand? No, that was that was when Windows three point one just okay. came out, and we did have, I believe, one Macintosh. And yeah, it was it was one of the very beginning Macintosh yeah. ones too at, at at one point. But nobody would do it because nobody knew anything about computers. And so, and it, but it was the only job I could find because so I didn't have any skills. You how to you know. sell, right? They, they yeah, just kind of gave you the, the big code words. Yeah, the buzzwords it, to say. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and they didn't even know them at the time. That was the thing is they I mean, nobody knew how to sell computers. Wow, back then. that's funny. <laughs> you know, but it was yeah, I couldn't find a job in Seattle for someone to pay me to surf. So, yeah, you know, I figured I, I may as well do that. And the funny thing was was I I learned very quickly that yeah, I'm a terrible salesman. I'm not good at it, but what I love to do, because people would buy these computers and then they didn't know how to work them. Mm-hmm. And so I would go and I would teach them how to work these computers. And what I was doing was I was teaching myself while yes. I was teaching them because right. I didn't know either. And then their computers would break down and of course there's no repair shops. <laughs> and so I would go and I would help them repair them. And that's how I got into networking was I just, wow. I realized that I love working on computers. Mm-hmm. And so I became a network engineer. worked with, I worked with Microsoft, uh, HP, Compact Gosh. many times, or worked with Microsoft twice. I didn't learn the first time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. It and, took two times to figure out that you didn't want to be there. Yeah. And, and I, I caveat with that. Microsoft was way different back in the '90s than it is now. I've got a friend that works there, and he just absolutely loves it. They they treat him like gold. Yeah. Back then, they didn't treat her, the employees no. like gold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've come a long way in employee engagement. Yeah. Definitely. So you had that entrepreneurial spirit, it sounded like, from a pretty young age. Oh, yeah. I mean, even when I was, you know, when I was selling computers, I started my own business fixing computers. And when I was working at Microsoft, one of the first things I did when when Windows 95 first came out is um, I developed a website on how to troubleshoot it for people because it was taking two or three hours for people to get on to the get answers on the help desk. Yeah. And so I designed a website to help people out. And realized that websites were the future back. That was in 1995. And yeah, so I've I've had that entrepreneurial spirit most of my life. Yeah. And so when did you start uh, figuring out uh, the strategic uh, leadership? And and what does that mean? That's, you know, the doctor of strategic leadership. 
Uh, and then, of course, you wrote a book called Timeless SEO Secrets. And so how, does, how do we transition from like selling computers, kind of learning the network mm -hmm. to figuring out what SEO does and the importance of it for all of us and also the strategic leadership uh, plan that you have? Well, when I did my website on troubleshooting Windows 95, it was a big website. It must have been 50, 60 pages, which was pretty big for back then. Yeah. And But I realized that people weren't going to it. And that's when I started learning SEO. But it wasn't called SEO back then. It wasn't called anything. It, right. There was no term for it. But the algorithm still kind of existed. Nobody just really figured out. Well, no. I, and I think I think that even the search engines were trying to figure it out back then because Google wasn't around mm -hmm, back then. It was mm -hmm. it was Yahoo that had just come out and was yeah. getting really big, and I just I just started looking at the websites that were getting to the top of the search engines, and I found a way to look at the back end techie coding oh, wow. coding stuff and figure out why they were getting to the top of the search engines. And I started doing that with my own stuff. Yeah, and so when I started my own business in <laughs> 2002, and, and I that's. I started doing that just as a part of doing what at web design, it was a web design company back then. And then we offered the marketing at no extra charge just to get people to, to do the web design. Right. And, right. and it's funny how things have changed because now everyone do can the do their marketing. own web. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody can do their own marketing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Code daddy makes that part easy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we actually, it's, it, we, we make, I'd say 90% of our, of our, of our revenue is marketing now and 10% is actual web design. So it's completely switched. Let's take a look at the book, timeless SEO secrets. Um, how did, how did you come about writing this? Uh, what, what made you, you know, think, yes, there's a, there's a need for this out there. And I know there is, cause I I'm fighting with uh, this stuff <laughs> every day with my YouTube channel and trying to get that monetized and of course, you know, podcast, all that stuff. So right. uh, yeah, tell us about how this came about. It was really, it was in 2017, the, the first time that I wrote the first edition of Thomas mm. SEO Secrets. And what I realized was we were really doing a lot of marketing and, and I was talking with clients about it. And I realized that there are some things that I was doing back in 1995 yeah. that I'm still doing today with doing search engine optimization and doing online marketing. There are some things that had just simply have not changed. Mm -hmm. They've morphed a little bit, but even yeah. that, not a lot. Okay. And that's why I decided to write the book because the things that, that I talk about in the book, not only are there, are there things that haven't changed, there are things that I'm going to talk about Google specifically. Yeah. Google is working even harder to do right now but they're also things that you can do yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a techie nerd. You don't have to learn all the coding to do these particular things. Well, give us a, a top, you know, three things that will help us uh, get to this part ourselves to, to, to help us get our websites or our yeah. puny websites to the first you know, couple pages so people can actually see them. Uh, I'll pick on the top two because okay. the top two are ones that I really push a lot. And, and one of the top two is understanding keywords. And understanding keywords is really about, think about it. Google is not a search engine. Okay. Google is a problem solver. Mm. When you go to Google, what do you do? You're not trying to search for something. You're trying to solve a problem. That's, hold on. That's a, <laughs> that's a good one. That one, that one deserves a little lightning bolt there. So <laughs> you're right. Every time I go to Google, I'm not searching for something. I'm looking to solve a problem. Right. And the keywords... And the keywords are there so that, because as business people, we want to solve someone's problem. The right. bigger problem we can solve, the more money we can make. <laughs> right. And so what we need to do is we need to find the keywords that people are searching for when they're trying to solve that problem. Right. And so keywords are huge because you could be a plumber and let's say you're a plumber in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and you, you, you say, okay, well, I want the plumbing keyword. I want to be right at the top. I want to be number one for plumbing. Yeah. But does it matter if someone in Florida no. finds your website? No, it, you're right. not going to drive no, it. Well, you might want to drive to Florida to, to do it, <laughs> but you're not going to. Yeah. You, you want to have the right keywords. So if you're a plumber in Los Angeles, it's not necessarily being top, top for plumber, but plumber in Los Angeles. Right. And so, so then you, sprinkling those into the website in a way that doesn't look obvious, right? It's got to be sort of sentence form. Is that right? Or do you yeah, plug you want to do in? it well. It's it's you want to write it well. But the first thing you want to do is you do want to find those keywords. And of course, understanding those keywords means you need to understand who your audience is. Right, right. And that that to me, you need to figure out exactly who your audience is and what yeah, they are important. looking for. Yeah. yeah. 
That's right. And then once you get that done, then you actually work on the content, the writing. So what you un understand the keywords first, then you work on writing those keywords into I think that's really where the good art quality form content. Comes in. Yeah, you know? definitely. Yeah, definitely. And Google actually, um, in 2021, uh, between uh, don't quote me, but around March and August, mm -hmm. there were five updates. Three of these five updates were huge updates to the Google's uh, search engine. Yeah, Google usually does two updates a year. Okay. They did five updates in about a six month period of time, and these bi the biggest parts of these updates were to help local businesses get higher in the search engines. Oh, okay. Finally, they're doing something for the business, small business instead of against it. Well, they've been trying to. What they realized in 2017 or 2018, they mm -hmm. did a study and they weren't looking for this, but coming out of the study, they found out that over half the people that get onto the Google search engine look for local products and services. Yes, that's right. And so that that they sense. realize that if they're going to, yeah. you know, go to their customer, they've got to start doing that. To where like three or four years ago, maybe even not that long ago, let's say you type in just you want let's say you want Nike shoes, you type in Nike shoes yeah. into the Google search engine and Nike's website comes up. That's you know, and all the national stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I just did that recently and on the right hand side, I'm not sure how they're gonna do this, but it looks like they're making more changes. On the right hand side, I had a list of local stores and the Nike shoes that they sell. Okay. And so that's cool because that, that means they're really working this local angle a so lot. So does that mean also that those local stores have something, a website, or at least something within Google with keywords that allows that to pull up when someone types in the Nike word in their area? Exactly. So yeah, the, they do. Google's not going out and looking for businesses. Businesses happen to have some sort of presence on the internet that allows them to come up on that right-hand side. So it's still right. up to you as the web designer or web uh, host or business owner to understand that keyword. Right. And that's the big thing about writing good quality mm -hmm. content. You get that good quality content, whether it's in your shopping cart, whether it's on your website, no matter what it is, you get that done well. Google's going to find that. They're going to see it and they're going to index it right. Provided right. your what? And here's the big caveat provided your website has been created correctly in the first place. Right. <laughs> right. So is that, is there a second? What's the second one? The first one was the, the keywords. And uh, is the second part about how to optimize and do all that kind of stuff? Or is that well, kind of the second is that part optimization? Is, well, optimization is, is like this umbrella. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the first one was keywords. The second one was content, writing the good oh, content. Writing that content. So the keywords, yeah. but then blending it into the content with the pictures and getting your address right and making sure all that stuff is there so that it can, it can able to be pulled up under those local searches. Right. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think, you know, the, what's the term mean uh, above the fold and below the fold? Where did that come from? Like well, I, I see it as like the old time newspapers, right? Like in the old yeah. days, you had to fold the newspaper and yeah. you had the big story was, you know, like above the fold. And then anything <laughs> below was like the secondary stories, right? Like so like the right. important stuff should be up top. That's kind of the way I always envisioned it before somebody scrolls. And that's exactly what it is. It's what okay. you see on your screen, no matter what your screen is, whether you're on a mobile phone, whether you're on a, a tablet or desktop, it's what you see on your screen before you have to scroll. Sweet. And so yeah, you're right. That, that comes right. from the old newspaper stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's right picture from the old timey newspapers, you know, cause you had to get it and then plop it open and <laughs> you had to fold there. That's what I figured that was about. Uh, I think yeah. Mike Aronowitz, uh, my old boss for, uh, uh, sales. Um, when I was doing sales and marketing, I think uh, I think he told me that. Maybe I have some breeze, some recollection now. Of Mike Arano, it's just looking at me like I'm an idiot. <laughs> what are you talking about, man? It's a newspaper, of course it is. <laughs> okay, sure, it makes yeah. sense to me. But um, so we're going to get in touch with you. We're going to send people your way. They, the best mm -hmm. place to get a hold of you is that the website or is that uh, your LinkedIn? The best place is definitely my website. And we we're on all the social medias, but our, the website is definitely the best place to, to actually contact me. So yeah. this is at portbell.com, P-O-R-T-B-E-L-L.com. Correct. And that's, that's what the website will look like when you get yeah. there. And um, again, the book is called Timeless SEO Secrets. It's on Amazon. That's what it looks like, uh, Timeless SEO Secrets. Yeah. Uh, Ty Belknap, B-E-L-K-N-A-P. Yeah, 
Yeah. And and just for people, if you do a search for Port Bell and you actually, if you find the article that shows the two security guards that were killed in Port Bell about a year ago, oh boy. that's Wrong not way. us. Just so you know, when <laughs> I started the company, I didn't know that there was a port in Africa called Port Bell. Oh, wow. And it's, uh, it seems like there's a lot of shady stuff that goes on mm. there, but that's not us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate you spending our time with us. What else do we need to know about, about you, Ty? What, how can we help you? And what's the next, what's coming up on the horizon? and for 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 you for the company we actually have quite a lot coming up but one thing that's going to be out here very soon hopefully it'll be out by the time this this even uh, uh airs is one of the big questions i've been getting mm-hmm. ever since covid started is how do i hire remote people yes and because all of my employees are remote right now and so we i've been doing this for years well we actually i'm working with mitch gray who is the author of a book how to hire and keep great people we're doing a absolutely free seven week course on how to hire remote workers and once it's up it'll be on the front page of my website so people can go there and they can go there they can do the course like i said it's absolutely free we're not trying to sell anything it's just something to help people throughout this COVID time and what's it going to be called how to hire remote workers and it'll be on your website yeah and the web so the website is portbell.com how to hire yeah how to hire remote workers remote workers because that's yeah. i mean that's what it is everyone's doing that today and uh yeah. how, how have you kept your employees engaged the ones that have gone home and how did that happen as far as keeping track of their productivity i mean you're a tech guy so it might be yeah. uh, what's the best did you use a tool to kind of track their time their hours of productivity what's the most important thing to track is it you know how many hours they work or what how many widgets they stamp out or what, what's your opinion on that for me it's all about results every person that, that works for port bell ever since 2004 mm-hmm. has been a remote worker okay so you are and, way ahead of the curve yeah yeah in fact back in 2004 when people found out that i only hired remote workers some some clients wouldn't hire me oh wow and i think it's <laughs> funny because now people are coming to me asking me how to do it yes of course <laughs> yeah so uh we're, yeah so that's great I, I like to um probably i'm gonna have another show called the risk factor and we'll talk about employee yeah. engagement and uh mental health issues with a lot of stuff uh, in the business place and stuff but yeah. really a lot of and, and so remote working especially with people with differing abilities right so people with handicaps yeah. it makes it hard for them to travel but uh are really some smart people out there can get some work done uh yeah. how to take advantage of that for our business so i'd love to have you back on and really go deep on that employee engagement when they're remote mm-hmm. Uh, the next uh, yeah, weeks. I'd love to talk about that because that is a very important subject. Let me know, text me or you know, email me when that comes out, when the site's uh, up, because I'll put it okay. on the post. But then, again, I'd like to get you on the risk factor and really dig into that employee engagement because that's really, this is about startup and overcoming diversity, mm-hmm. you know, and, and like you and I had our childhood stuff. Oh, yeah. But, um, but that show is really going to dig in on the shine that spotlight out on the employees. So mm-hmm. I'd, I'd love to have you back on there. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. I appreciate you joining us today. Give me a second. Let me say goodbye to my people, okay. and I'll be back with you to give you a proper goodbye. All right, great. I appreciate everybody tuning in right now on the GoProcast. Remember, you're listening to this because you find something you like, and uh, and really that's who we do this for. So if you have a friend, a coworker, a neighbor that thinks that uh, you might like, they might like the same kind of thing, please suggest us to them. Referrals are the best friend of, of any business, but for these podcasts, you know, this is how we get our word out. So we appreciate you. Make sure that you go pro.